When I say I want to create a community revolved around normalizing working with your dreams, I don't just mean talking about it on a podcast. And I don't even just mean online dream share meetups. I also mean in-person dream groups. I want to do dream retreats, talking about dreams and incubating dreams together. Surrounded by people who are also into working with their dreams in order to become more self-aware and improve yourself in whatever way possible. I'm starting to find more people talk about dreams online. That's how I found my guest for today's episode, whose name is Tisha, also known as Lady T. So if you like this podcast and you want to share a dream or ask a question or join the conversation, there's a million ways to do that. Discord, Clubhouse, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, whatever your preferred method, find us and support. So the last what, month or so, I've been working as an assistant farm managers. There's a friend of mine who is a farm manager for this 10 acre uh, garden and, you know, be- community garden, beautiful ideas. You know, we're going to do parties in the garden and, you know, giveaways and all that kind of stuff. I and so assisting her, which is really great because I love outside sunshine. That's what I need. So it's perfect. Um, but, you know, nonprofit, so you get paid pennies. So in the meantime, while doing that over the last, you know, three weeks or so, I'm like, okay, now let me focus on, um, you know, doing the dream stuff. So doing more videos to kind of get out there and starting to put together a meetup where um, we get together and get people to come together and talk about dreams, the dream, dream groups. But my main thing that I really wanted to do, I've been wanting to do for a long time, and that's dream retreats, dream incubation retreats. And um, so that's what I'm gearing up for right now. That's awesome. Super yeah. cool. We have some of those like similar goals. I'm excited to see it all come in fruition at, at the right time. When I saw your page on TikTok, I was like, yeah, I have to be friends with this woman now. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing. I love meeting people who are into dreams. Yeah, it's awesome. It's kind of funny how it's so niche still because you would think that everybody would want to know more about their dreams. But it's just so unfortunate because, you know, we it, it's, it's something that we all do. We all dream. Right. And it's something that we will do our entire lives. We were dreaming in the womb. Um, We will be dreaming until the day we leave this planet. And so why are you not into it, people? I don't know. I really don't get it. But I mean, that's kind of what we do is to inspire people to be like, wait, maybe I should listen to my dreams or that one was kind of weird or maybe I should, you know, learn more about it. So, you know, that little inkling of like interest is kind of a win for me. Yeah. What's your story like? Who are you? How'd you get into dreams? How'd you get here? Where did it all start? Okay. All right. So I am Tisha Shelby Houston, Lady T. Uh, It's just easier to remember, Lady T. And um, I got into, I've been into dreams my entire life. Um, Literally my entire life. Like I can remember my first childhood dream. I was 18 months old. Um, I've always, always been fascinated by dreams. And for some reason, I've always as far as I can remember, I've always understood other people's dreams. Not everyone, not all the time, but people would tell me their dreams, which is something else that was really weird, that people would tell me their dreams. I mean, I didn't think it was weird, but later on in life, I realized people don't just walk around talking about dreams to other people. So a friend of mine told me, you, you're always talking about people's dreams. People always come to you telling me about their dreams. Yeah, they do. That's weird. I was like, oh. Okay, I guess it is, come to find out. But anyhow, and so when people would tell me their dreams, I would automatically, in many cases, be able to say, oh, that's a perfect example of blah, 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 be able to make the connection, even with people that I didn't know. I never thought twice about it because I thought everybody was doing this, right? We all dream. So never thought twice about it until just a few years ago, I was talking to a friend and she was telling me about her dream. And we were laughing because it was so crazy and just really weird. And, uh, and I told her, I said, you know what you should do? You need to go outside and stand in the grass. And I bet you if you stand in the grass, you know, you'll have a, I don't know, a, a major bowel movement. And so we laughed and, you know, and all of that. She got off the phone. She said, she called me back in about 40 minutes. She's like, I went outside to smoke a cigarette. And I was thinking, that Tisha is crazy. She said, so I stepped out into the grass. She's like, you will not believe when I came back in the house, I had a major poop. The dream had nothing to do with poop. How did you know that? I didn't know that. Your dream told me that. She's like, no, it didn't. So anyway, she had such an re- emotional response. We were laughing about it, but she was also you know, in tears. And it made me realize and recognize how many times that it has happened in my life where 
I'll give someone just what I thought about their dreams and they would have an emotional response. And I understood at that moment, the power of your dreams in that they help you to connect to a bigger part of yourself. It helps you to um, see something that you didn't even see that's all within you. And so people tend to have a major emotional response to that. And so with on that particular day, I got on Facebook, I was like, I am a dream interpreter. I'm just going to claim myself as such because this has happened too many times and it's been, and the emotional reaction is always amazing. And, uh, and then, you know, like a few months later, I was like, let me just throw up a website and see what happens. I also recognize if I have the ability to help people to understand themselves and their dreams, I need to hone in on that ability. I don't even like to use the word a gift. It's not a gift. It's actually ability we all have, but I need to understand it. I need to learn how to use it to help people. My, I committed myself to, you know, studying symbi um, symbolism and, you know, understanding some of the ancient teachings of dreams and, you know, just went really, really hard into learning about dreams and the history. And I've always been into psychology. Yeah, so that's what I've done over the last few years, you know, just really committed to doing this as a way of helping people because we we need it. And especially now we need it. We really need to tune in. Um, and that's something I talk about a lot. You remember um, 2020 when you had half the country yelling at people because they didn't have on masks and the other half of the country yelling at people because they had on math. And my conversation was, truth is within you. There are some people that need to put that mask on and they need it on. And there are some people that, you know, they do not need the mask for whatever reason. And stop yelling at each other, tune in for what you need. You know, do you need that vaccine or do you not need it? And whatever you decide, that's for you to determine. And, you know, you can get that answer from your dreams even. I think it's really important at this time that we learn. We learn ab about ourselves and tune in. Okay. Did you say that you had your, you remember a dream from when you were 18 months? Let me back up yeah. a little bit. That's really interesting. That's so young. Yeah. 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 You don't remember. What's oh, your baby. first dream? you remember okay so I started having lucid dreams I was like seven or eight I remember dreams from like maybe five like my earliest memory of existence is like three or four maybe mm -hmm. so that's why it's cool to me but so the fact that you dream that early that's cool yeah I now that's something I don't do I don't rarely am I lucid um and it's you know it happens spontaneously and when it does happen it almost fades away immediately. Like I had a lucid dream mm, a few months ago and um, I was talking to, so my mom passed six years ago, right? So here's another dream and it's my mother. And I'm like, mom, oh my gosh. You know, and I do this on every dream. Oh, I thought you left me. And she's like, girl, you know, I didn't leave you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm so glad you come. And so in this particular case, I started telling her about all the dreams that I've had. Yeah. I keep having these dreams that you left me. And you know, like the last time I dreamt, and I told her about the dream, dream, which you had on the yellow dress and you was walking down. And all the while she's looking at me and she's laughing. And, you know, I was like, then I had another dream that you left. And I was trying to remember the dream. My dreaming self said, just like right now, you're dreaming. And I was like, this is a dream? No. Anyway, mom, I had a dream. <laughs> you mm, <laughs> right back almost, the almost. So, and it was funny when I woke up, I was like, ah, I told myself I was dreaming. When I was telling my mother about my dreams, <laughs> but I went right back into the dream. So yeah, I don't go lucid too often. Even when I take the, you know, the different herbs that now when I take the different herbs, that's when I have sleep paralysis, but a lot of the herbs help people to go lucid. I don't do that. Everybody's different. And I think that's a really interesting thing as well. Like you are so good at dream interpretation. I'm more better at lucid dreaming, which I think is cool because I, I don't know. Dream interpretation is so much fun, but I'm always confused of more of like a gift or an ability, kind of like you said. I feel like it is more of an ability. We can all get better at it, just like lucid dreaming. Some people are more natural than others, you know, and I don't think that that's, I think that's just how it is, like with anything in life, really. How do you think that we can get better at learning how to interpret dreams? Because it seems like you kind of have like, like a, a more of a gift where you're just told like, oh, it could mean this and you don't even know why you're, why <laughs> you're saying that. All right. 
have no clue. Um, you know, like you said, we are all tuned into certain aspects of ourselves more than others, right? So some people are better at math. Um, some people, we even though we all have the capacity to understand math, um, some people are, you know, better at, you know, meditation than others, even though we can all meditate. And so, yeah, some people are more in tuned to uh, dreaming. So I think that we can better tune in to understanding dreams and dream interpretation by first tuning into ourselves. I don't think it's really as necessary for dream interpreters if we all tuned in for ourselves. But let me take that back. But it is necessary. So it's just like um, health. If we all tuned in to our own bodies, we can heal ourselves. But doctors are still necessary. So if we all tune into our dreams, we can understand ourselves better, understand our dreams, the messages from our subconscious. But yeah, I guess a dream analyst, a dream interpreter would still be necessary. Yeah, it could definitely help, especially when somebody doesn't really know where to start. Do you have any like kind of like rules that you go by or um, anything that kind of guides you when helping someone interpret their dreams? Because say it's someone that you don't really know and you don't know their maybe subconscious connections and personal meanings to things, you know? How do you approach giving them thoughts of what their dream could be showing them? So uh, so whenever I do dream interpretation sessions, um, you know, I always start off by letting the caller know, because, you know, people call me with their dreams. I let them know, you know what your dream means better than I do. And I start every call off with that because they really do. And so I'll tell them that first. And then in, when people tell me their dreams in 60% of the cases, I know exactly what it means or I have an inkling, but in the other 40%, I, I have no clue. But because I've done the studies, because I've looked into, you know, getting certified as a dream analyst, because I've, you know, worked really hard to understand dreams over the last few years, um, I know where to, I know how to intuitively guide them, ask them questions until they start waking up to what the dream means for them. And then in many cases, it, then it clicks in for me too, even before it gets to them. I don't tell them immediately. You know you know how that is. You like people to light up. When they get it, it's just a better connection than when you just tell them. That's good dream interpretation, moral code, because it's a beautiful moment when they're like, oh yeah, and they kind of got to the conclusion themselves. It almost is more meaningful. Right, right. When they're like, oh, you know, well, come to think of it, I don't care how many times I do. It's just like flying. I flew every, almost every week for about six years straight. And then off and on, you know, 19 years, you know, every month. Getting on an airplane was always amazing to me. It just always blew my mind. And it's the same thing with dream interpretation. I don't care how many sessions I do in a month's time. I'm always amazed and I always laugh. And I'm just as shocked as the, as the caller like, wow, your subconscious went through all of that to tell you that? That's so cool. It's, you know, it amazes me every time. It is cool. And I have some really long, detailed, like little details, sim like symbol heavy dreams. Do you feel like those are more fun or not, not better or worse, but what do you feel is more, comes easier for you to understand? Like rich yeah. dreams are kind of like more abstract, bland ones. All love them is amazing to me. But when they are really long and extremely detailed and they just go on and on and on, um, I always tell um, people to summarize the theme for yourself. Summarize the theme. So with all the details, what was the main thing? And then you want to focus in on What's some of the conversations in the dream? What were some of the words that you remember? What was a song playing in the background? Is better, that's easier to connect with than all the twists and turns of a, you know, of a long dream. Do you feel like lucid dreams versus non-lucid dreams? Is there a difference there in messages because more so you're consciously acting in your dream versus receiving something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and then I want, to, I want you to ask the answer that question. I, like I said, I don't lucid dream. I spontaneous lucid dream here and there. Um, and when people call me, they're usually not calling me about their lucid dreams. When people call me, and this is the, you know, my market, the people that I, that I help, they are just so enamored by the fact that they are now recognizing their dreams or recognizing dreams have messages that that's all they want to know. So there is a whole, you know, conglomerate of people who are just tuning into their dreams and lucidity is way out there. Mm. That's not 
conversation to have with them. You know what I'm saying? Which is the reason people like you, like you're so important because you can talk to people who are doing the lucid dreaming. My thought is, and you tell me, if you are controlling it, do you really get a message? Are you really getting a message when you're controlling the dream? It depends. So definitely not as much because when I'm not lucid, the dream is given to me as is the narrative. And I believe there's different kinds of dreams, you know, like we have the big messages and then we have the daily subconscious processing stuff. And then, but then right. lucid is like its own category because the dream still has a mind of its own. It's still forming itself, the storyline of the dream. And lucid doesn't mean you can control it. So lucid is the spectrum of how consciously aware are you and how present are you of the dream state, how, you know, how aware you are of it. And so you can be lucid without controlling the dream and you're watching it go down and you know it's a dream, but you're still taking it in for how it's coming to you. But then yeah. if I have had lucid dreams where I was changing the dream. I decided to do something else. I didn't focus on the dream message at hand, but I do mm. still think it's there. It's just about, are you, do you choose to engage with it or you have the choice to go do something else and fly around if you want to, which is you're not always able to. So which do you prefer? Which happens more often for you? Are you more lucid or are you more regular mundane dream dreaming? More regular. I wouldn't say mundane because my dreams are very vivid, colorful, symbol rich, but I get lucid maybe like, you know, four dreams out of the week, give or take. It depends on a lot of factors. So it's sprinkled in there. I would, that's definitely more than the average. Like some people get lucid once a year, once a month, it varies. But it's not the norm, which I think is a good thing because there are people that get lucid in every single dream ever. Um, it's called Omni or people that are just highly lucid, like 80, 90 percent of the time. Um, and I can't imagine what that would be like because I appreciate my non-lucid dreams because it makes lucidity feel like a fun little gift. Like yeah. an adventure, you know, and I don't feel exhausted after because it's like, you know, it's more sparse. Um, so that's my experience. But again, everyone's different. And I think that's really cool. And so can you tell me about your first lucid dream that you recall? You said five. Oh yeah, I was like five to eight. It was actually a nightmare because that is one thing that gets me lucid a lot is being so scared that I'm like, I hope this is a dream. And then I figure out if it's a dream or not. So that's a big trigger. I was like having this nightmare about a lion chasing me and some kidnappers chasing me. And then I went into this house where I thought I was safe and my favorite cartoons were playing, but then there was like some mummies in the house or something. And the mummies wanted to, were mad at me. Like I, I made them mad somehow. And so then I was trying to get out of that house. And then I realized when I walked through the front door, it just kind of hit me like, Oh, I'm dreaming. And then at the time I didn't realize that lucid dreaming, there's all these amazing things you could do. So I was just like, okay, well I'll just wake up and I wasn't scared anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I would just be like, okay, I know I can wake up or, you know, the fear would just melt away. And to this day, I still get lucid off of that. Like, oh my God, this is so scary. It has to be a dream. Let me do a reality check. But this time I stay and I explore, or maybe, you know, you can do more conscious work with finding the messages of a dream. So if you decide to look for the messages, you can ask a dream character for clarification. So sometimes when you're lucid, you get more of the message if you want to. Yeah. So I guess there's that. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. I know I was not lucid as a kid. Oh, dang. And that would be so much fun as a child. But I did teach my children how to, when they're having nightmares, how to change the dream up. Um, I did teach them that. And so I was I was with my sons this weekend, as a matter of fact, three three of the four sons. And um, I asked them, are they, do they still have control over their dreams? And they said they actually do, which is pretty cool. But also I don't sleep as much. And that makes a big difference. So, you know, becoming lucid for me has never really been an issue because it's like, I need to sleep. I don't want to think about anything. <laughs> So that's super cool. I did um, I did say just recently, I thought to myself, okay, I need to, now that I can actually sleep, I'm not taking care of my father or taking care of the kids or, you know, out, you know, traveling in the country. Now I'm a little more settled. Um, I did say I would dive into lucidity. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I'll help you. If you have any questions or anything you want to know, tips, advice, I love teaching people so well I listen to your podcast all the time so yeah. yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get into it because it's also another thing is 
it goes with phases. Like I'm sure, you know, there's right timing for everything. We have these ebbs and flows and we go through phases with everything in life. And lucidity is the same way. Even me, sometimes I don't get lucid for a while or I have something going on and I don't focus on it. And I'm not just sometimes in general, I'm just not consciously aware, even in waking life. So it comes and goes. And I think that's normal. And that's the same thing, even with dreams, you know, I'll have people say to me, um, you know, I'm just not remembering my dreams. And, you know, it's been a while. I haven't had a dream. I'm like, first of all, you do have dreams. You're not recalling the dreams. And sometimes, you know, your dreams just not as, are, your dreams are not as vivid as they were, you know, maybe five years ago when you were going through A, B and C, you know, a happy time or a sad time, you know, ebbs and flows. And that's what we have to give ourselves to, you know, we have to give ourselves to that and everything. Yeah, a hundred percent. So let's talk about dream incubation a little bit, which you said was one of your favorite things. Yeah. It's so cool. So you said you won the lottery the other day and the dream gave you the number. Is this true? Yes, it is true. I don't play, I don't play the lottery. Um, I hate losing money. I don't care if it's 50 cents. <laughs> and but every now and then when it gets up to some crazy number, like right now here. In South Carolina, it's $834 million. You know, I'll throw a dollar into it and then I'll get mad because dang on it, I just add it to the system that's just sucking on poor people. Uh, but anyhow, people who are desperate for hope. So I don't play the lottery, uh, but maybe once or twice a year. However, with my father's passing, I just had a couple of, you know, really cool things that happen that says, ooh, okay, so spirit is definitely real and speaking. And then I was like, and I had someone to ask uh, on the same day, I had something crazy happen. Uh, someone asked me, can you dream the lottery? And I said, yeah, you know, you probably could. People probably can dream lottery numbers because we can all tap into the future. We've had that experience, but too many people are desperate for it or they are fearful or, you know, whatever. They're too attached, attached emotionally. And so even if you dreamt of it, dreamt the lottery numbers, you probably wouldn't recognize the dream or, you know, be able to really trust it or tune into it. So, yeah, I, I believe people can. As a matter of fact, there are lots of people who dreamt lottery numbers and won. But when I said that to the person by text and I had this thing that happened in my house, my father's clock went out and then came back on at a particular time, which is, you know, I was like, oh, OK, daddy. Let's do some lottery numbers. Yeah, help me out. <laughs> right. So now that's what I said on that day. I had a dream that night about my father. And it's the first time I dreamt of him since he passed. And I was writing the dream down in my dream journal. And I noticed on this page, I just scribbled this one line in pencil that said, um, it had the lottery number 7134 is 10, 10 miles in water. This is in my dream journal. When did I write that? In pencil. Why do I write in pencil? I don't write my dream journal in pencil. Why is this on this page? So anyway, I wrote out my, you know, my dream about my father and what happened. And then I thought, oh, I'll play that number. And I wouldn't play the number and it came out that night. So that was so super cool. $2,000. That's a big win. That's, <laughs> that's a life-changing amount of money. You can do a lot with $2,000. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot. And then you, you're already broke. It's, it's I know. Gone. Two months that you pay your rent and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, I'm gonna get you this and of that. And okay, that's the end of that. <laughs> but you know what's more valuable is the fact that our dreams can really do that. And I know there's so many factors to it, but like you said, there's been stories of people that have done it. And I think the more intentional you are with it, the more success you will have. And I've done other little challenges with other dream groups and stuff. Like there was one at the conference. I think they do it every year where you mm -hmm. try to dream up an image, you know, that's some, that's in a secret little envelope or whatever. And people get really close or, you know, get certain parts of it. So what do you think, like, how do you think that is possible? Like, what is it in our dreams that allows us to access more information than what we know? When it comes to dreaming, and no matter how much science is out there, how, how much research, how many times the neuroscientists dig into our brains, you really cannot go inside of every person's brain and understand this thing that you can't touch. So there won't be enough science to prove this. But, you know, we know that time is not real. Now, Albert Einstein did prove that, you know, time is relative. Time really doesn't exist. Everything is happening right now. Um, we know that the subconscious mind 
has the ability to, the subconscious mind knows more than the conscious mind, right? They tell us that if you walk into a room and the room has, you know, lots of windows, lots of tiles, lots of pictures, if they were to hypnotize you and they ask you how many tiles were on the floor, you would be able to tell them the number because your subconscious mind is able to pick that up, whereas your conscious mind can't. So the subconscious mind has access to information that we cannot access on a conscious level. So when you go to sleep and you're in that dimension where there is no time or space and your subconscious mind is roaming around without the rules that we have in this dimension, you have access to all kinds of information. And it's just a matter of being able to bring it back to this realm when you wake up. And that's our biggest challenge. But here's the thing, and you know, this is the thing for me that I've learned over my, you know, short years of life. And that is, I'm learning how to trust that I'm bringing back that information anyway, whether I recall the dream or not. If I ask a question in my sleep, it may take a couple of days before I get the answer. So, okay, then we can go into dream incubation. There'll be three days before I get the answer. And then there'll be some times where I don't get the answer at all. I don't recall the dream at all, but I've learned to trust I got the answer. So just move forward. That's true. It is stored back in there. And I notice when sometimes randomly, like a month later, something will trigger a dream memory, like, oh, that was in my dream. And that just makes me think like, okay, I remember it now. So it must have been in there this whole time that I didn't even realize. Right, exactly. So, okay, let's go back to the lottery number. So, you know, it was on a Thursday that I said, okay, or it was on a Wednesday. I said, okay, let me see if I can dream up the dream of the lottery number. And it was a Thursday morning. I'm writing down. I didn't dream the lottery number, but I did dream about my dad and I wrote it down. But, oh, I wrote it down on a page where I had already started writing the dream which was the lottery number. And I, you know, I was like, when did I write that? When did I write that? Cause I didn't even put a date up there. I recall writing that I was, I was kneeling at my bed scribbling and that was about a three or four days prior. Okay. How did I three days later say, I want a lottery number and I'm asking my father, okay, daddy, give me a lottery number. Dream about my father, write it down. But the lottery number was already there. How did that freaking happen? Wow. Yeah, talk about jumbled secret of events. Exactly. But that's also, cool. you got to trust the answer mm -hmm. is there for whatever question that you may ask. You just trust that you're going to get the answer. How, what kind of things do, can you incubate? Like other than lottery numbers, how might somebody find this useful? Well, I'm not going to say you can incubate lottery numbers, although I am going to put it to the test. Right. Uh, you could try. Right. I'm, right. Exactly. I'm going to, I have to settle now because like I say for everyone else, usually, you know, you're so caught up emotionally. You just can't read, you can't receive the lottery numbers. Now I'm caught up emotionally. I'm like, Ooh, I want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can incub incubate any problem that you are trying to solve because the subconscious mind is always helping you to solve your problems. Anyway, you know, the purpose of the subconscious mind is to keep you alive. It keeps your body, in a, you know, your blood regulated, your heart rate. It keeps everything in order because it keeps you alive. And so because the subconscious mind's job is to keep you alive, it gives you answers. It helps you out. And sometimes the answer is an exaggerated fear because it's trying to keep you alive. Stay away from that. And it may not be realistic, right? Sometimes it feeds us paranoia, paranoia but that's because we've been feeding it paranoia. And so it's feeding back to us to keep us alive. But the subconscious mind's job is to keep you alive. And so therefore it will give you answers to help move you along. So if you need to solve a problem, you're trying to figure out what to do in your relationship. You're trying to figure out how to break a habit. Um, you need help with um, how to heal a particular party. Uh, who should you talk to? Where should you go next? That answer is in there. All the answers that we have for any question that we have, any problems is in there. And so you just, you dream on it. You sleep on it. Yeah. It's, that's why they call dreams your internal therapist. Cause you really can work yourself through it. And it's like, I like what you said earlier about being patient and open-minded because maybe the answer will come through something else. And that's why sometimes when I'm incubating something or I have a lot of dream tasks for mostly for when I'm lucid, but even for just my regular dreams too. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'll have the same task for like weeks or even months and I'll come back to it or whatever. 
Um, so I don't want people to get like, oh, I'm going to try to get this answer today and tomorrow right. it'll be solved. Some patience to it. How, so, so how long do you get an answer? Have, have you found that there's a, a time frame? It really depends. Like, it really depends on what it is. Usually like at least a month. If it goes too long, I'll just be like, okay, I'll just try something else and maybe I'll come yeah. back to it later or yeah. something like that. I'm pretty loose with it, but I do use it a lot. Sometimes I'll just kind of do things when I become lucid, I will just think of things in the moment that I know that I need. I'll be like, okay, what have I been working on lately? And I'll start to look for answers for whatever I feel like I'm struggling with in that moment. So it kind of just changes with my life, I guess, with whatever yeah. I have going on. Gee, that's so amazing to hear people who are become lucid in their dreams and they can remember what's going on in their waking life to be able to ask the question. I can, I have not it's been able crazy. to. It's crazy. And so, sometimes I forget, but I do sit there and think like, okay, what I, I have to think for a minute when I'm lucid to connect to my life. It's kind of weird because I'm like in this dream and then I have to remember like, oh yeah, like I'm this person with this life. And it, it takes a second to like center yourself. It really is where the skill comes in because then you have to stay in the dream and not wake up. So that's a whole right. thing, but you'll get there. I already know you're a pro. Well, I've been watching my hand at night because now I am trying to incubate lottery ticket, lottery numbers, but I don't want to spend money on lottery. But anyway, <laughs> but I am watching my hand um, just to start getting lucid and then, you know, I'll work out a question. But um, I know for me, when it comes to incubating, it's usually three days that I get an answer. Um, now that's me, but I've been doing this for years. This is my method that's got me through life. Three days, same thing, even if I hear a song that I really like, it'll show up three days later in my dream. <laughs> so it's something about three for me. Uh, but there was this period of time um, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I was trying to determine because the doctors wanted to do chemo, mastectomy, radiation right then and there on the spot. And I was trying to determine, should I do that? or should I go a different route? And I'm watching my dreams. I never got an answer, never. And that blew me away because that was the first time. Now I recognize cycles and all of that. You know, there are times that it'll work and sometimes it won't. But that was the first time that it didn't work for me. Any question I've ever ever need, you know, I lost my wallet one time. I couldn't, I looked all over, couldn't find the wallet. Okay, I'm gonna dream on it. Went to sleep, asked a question. The next day I woke up, I didn't recall a dream. But I woke up and said, you know where my wallet is and went right to it, right? And so here I am with the most important question in the world, breast cancer, what should I do? And I got nothing. Absolutely. I was livid. Why do you think that is? <laughs> um, okay. So what I determined, because I was in 2000, and so now we're many years away from that. And the, what I determined from that is it was a matter of spirit saying, whatever you want to do. That's what I got from that. Whatever you want to do, it's going to be right. That whatever answer you choose is going to is going to be the right answer. Which I was like, it's not going to be a right answer if I get my breast cut off and chemo and radiation. How is that right if it's not necessary? But, um, you know, here we are on the other side of it a number of years. And I determined then I'm not going that route, which actually was my first, almost my first response. I'm not going the route of immediately, you know, he's like, we'll schedule out in the next two weeks, chemo, radiation, mastectomy. Mm, hang on one second, doctor. I need to meditate on this before I agree to that. And so I'm, you know, he said, go ahead and take the weekend. You know, I guess you're not going to die over the weekend. Go ahead. And so that's what I did. And I came up with, yeah, I'm not going that route, but let me make sure. So I went back to the doctor, asked questions. He couldn't answer my questions. I asked questions about health and healing. And is it true that my body could heal itself? And, you know, I've seen people online who, you know, are using herbs to heal cancer. Is that? And so he couldn't answer those questions. And so I was like, okay, well, let me talk to a different doctor and another doctor. So I didn't just say, I'm not going that route. I'm not listening to you. And when I went and got the second and third opinion, I still came to the same conclusion. It's not time for me to do that. And that's the route I went. Now, all the while, I'm waiting for the answer from my dreams. I'm waiting for the answer. And I never got an answer. But I decided not to do that. Ten years later. So I, what I did was I changed my eating. I changed my lifestyle. I changed, you know, I worked up with my body to heal itself. Ended up having three babies during that time, which the doctor, one of the doctors told me, Mrs. Houston, if you're not going to go our recommended, the, the way we recommend, then I will tell you, do not get pregnant because it will cause the cancer to metastasize and it will spread all over your body because of the hormones of pregnancy. So do not get pregnant. 
I was like, oh, no problem. Ooh, we got two kids. I had custody of my nephew. We had three kids. I'm good. I don't, we're not going to have another baby. My oldest was 10. And so, uh, you know, spirit likes to play jokes. And that's why I had three babies back to back. Oh, wow. <laughs> three babies back to back. And, but I did a whole lifestyle change, eating, you know, work with my body to heal itself. And then almost 10 years later, I had three dreams and those three dreams on the same night, back to back dreams, and I actually have them in my journal, told me it was time to do the, I decided I was going to do mastectomy. I'm not doing chemo and non doing radiation, but I, it was time to do the surgery. And so that's what I decided to do, but only after I had those dreams uh, when I decided to do that. So, you know, and at that point, I wasn't trying to dream of an answer. Uh, at that point, I was just, you know, minding my own business, just grooving through life. But I had three dreams that said, now is the time. And that's what I did. Wow, that is a great amount of faith and just following your intuition. And I love that. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I mean when I say this is the time for us, us to all tune into our dreams, because, you know, there's so much chaos in our society right now. And everything is moving so quickly. You know, the technology is moving so quickly and so many fears are being perpetuated that if you don't tune in, you will be pulled to and fro in every area of life. Oh, the jobs are, mm -hmm. you know, shut down. Oh, the, you know, the doctor said this is the problem. Oh, the, this is the problem. You know, there'll be so much that will distract you and cause you fear and run you ragged. You've got to be able to sit still and tune in. And if that's through meditation. That's powerful. If it's through dreams, that's another powerful way. Yes, that is a gem because there is so much going on and there's all these different gifts that we all have different abilities and there's ways to tune in. And there's a lot of things within dream work, lucid dreaming, interpretation, there's liminal dreaming, you know, all different types of dreams. So in terms of your process um, of getting an answer from your dreams. What does that look like? Can you kind of walk me through? Is it something you say to yourself? Do you journal? Like what's the process look like? So when I'm incubating a dream, which I'm doing right now, because again, with my father's passing, that's, that frees me up a little bit. So now I have a whole life shift going on. Lots of options are available to me. And so which way should I go? So that means drinking teas, um, certain teas that will induce dreams. Um, that means uh, making sure that I'm resting. That means sitting still to meditate, which I'm not great at meditating. <laughs> I do it, but I'm not great at it. And I'm like, ah, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, ah, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm still not good at it. No, I don't need to do it. But right now, yes, I do. I need to sit still. I need to quiet my mind. And then it's writing the question out in my journal um, before I go to sleep and just doing it every night until an answer comes for uh, an answer comes to me or until because this is what's happening right now. I haven't heard in my dreams a thou shall go forth and do A, B, and C. But it seems like my environment is ordering itself that now I can go forth in A, B, and C. Oh, I didn't even dream it, but look at it, it's working out. It's working. I love that. That's great. And that's what I mean when I say you dream it, you can't recall, you ask the question in your dream, you may not be able to recall it, but you trust that it's going to work out. Yes, that's true. And another thing is like, people forget the waking life part of it. You know, you got to take action in your waking life. If you get a message or a lesson or whatever from your dreams, apply it to your life, still do the work, you know, get up, like you said, be the best version of you, sit still, tune in, whatever you got to do to get to the answer. Right. And, and, you know, don't get stuck on just asking the question. When you see things lining up, that's a sign for you to go forth because the dream world will spill over into your waking life. The subconscious mind will help you to spot. And I can't, I didn't recall the dream, but it's happening right there. Oh, that's the connection for what I was asking about. Even though it's scary, I'm going to go forth because that's the question that I was asking about. Right. So you got to move forward in the direction. Yeah, 100%. Um, so what are the herbs? Like what kind of herbal teas do you use or dream enhancers um, that you know of? Yeah. So, you know, the, we know the regular mugwort and blue, blue lotus. And I shouldn't use the word let regular. <laughs> Let me take that back. <laughs> we know the kingpins of herbal teas that will induce dreams, um, blue lotus being one of them. 
uh, which is very nasty. Matter of fact, I just did a, a TikTok on how nasty it is. Uh, and so one of the things that I learned to do, do you use Blue Lotus at all? Yeah, I do. I like it. I don't find it as nasty, like tasty. I mix it with other tea flavors, though, so I don't do it by itself. Oh, my gosh. You're so nasty. <laughs> But what I've been doing is because, you know, sometimes nights I'm so busy and I don't brew a tea and then I'm ready to just fall in the bed. But now I got to mm-hmm. wait for it. To fall off. Oh, same. I have that every day. <laughs> right. Exactly. So what I do is I just put a few petals underneath my tongue and I sleep with it under my tongue during the night. I've never thought of that. Yeah. So that's been working. That actually has helped to make my dreams more vivid. Um, There is a difference between drinking it and I need to document exactly. The thing is, I'm doing this. I've been doing it for, you know, 25 years or so. And now we have social media and now I talk about it publicly. It's like, oh, crap, I got to figure out the words and the language to be able to help people for something I've been doing without even thinking about. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, so, yes, Blue Lotus is one that's very, it's very good for uh, inducing dreams, opening your third eye but it also has medicinal value as well. Um, As a matter of fact, I did a whole TikTok on the medicinal and the uh, magical properties of certain herbs, Uh, just because, you know, there is the the research behind blue lotus, even though they don't talk about it much. But anyhow, so blue lotus, mugwort, poppy seed is another great one. Um, Valerian, is great you know those are sedatives and they actually help you to go off to sleep and then they're the ones that help you to dream so valeria helps you to go to sleep blue lotus mugwort helps to induce dreams poppy seeds also helps you helps to induce dreams as well chamomile helps you to relax to be able to go off to sleep and the thing that's so amazing to me is that all of these herbs are you know anti-inflammatory anti you know all of that I'm like, dang, if all these herbs do all of that, that's the reason why we have so much health, so many health problems now, because we don't take herbs naturally and normally, you know, regularly and consistently. We do it when we need a dream or we do it when we, but if we do it on a regular basis, our body would be a little more balanced. That's true. I think it's kind of neglected in healthcare, seen as more like Oh, homeopathy, plant medicine and stuff, but it's powerful, man. And yeah, I've actually heard about valerian root for like anxiety and other mental right. health things before I even thought about using it for dreams. Um, so it's cool, you know, to experiment and make your own mixtures, find what you like, mix different teas or some people smoke them or whatever works for you. Right. And you do have to mix it. Um, I have a mixture that I was you know, I had it up on my website and I was selling it, but it's still, it's just easier just to tell people to get your own than try to mix it and send it out. But I mean, I do give it away and I, you know, give it to friends and all of that. But as far as I'm going to pack it up and sell it every single week, I ain't doing all of that. But my point that I'm really making is you have to find what works for you because I found that mugwort, actually, if I don't mix it with certain things, mugwort will, will give me nightmares and sleep paralysis. As a matter of fact, my first experience with my board, I put it in a little sachet and I put it next to me on the pillow so that I could smell it. And I'll be dang on if I didn't have a dream, a nightmare immediately. The first, I don't know, first 30 minutes of sleep, I woke up from a nightmare <laughs> and I was in a hotel. I was out of town and at a hotel. And that is so freaking scary when you're in a hotel and you have a nightmare. There's no one around. You're like, <laughs> yeah, that sucks. And then you got to go back to sleep and you're all like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I don't like you. I yeah. threw it across. Um, and I, but I said, when I get home, I'll use it. And so the second time I did the same thing, put it on my pillow next to, next to me. And I had a nightmare that night as well within the first hour. So um, what I've done is I pull back. Okay, I'm not smelling it anymore. I'm drinking it <laughs> and I'm mixing it with something to help calm me first, like um, lavender and chamomile mix it with that and so it works now for me really nicely nice yeah lavender is a great one i love lavender i always yeah. use smells of lavender yeah yeah you have to learn what works for us and like yeah. you said you know, you're gonna smoke it drink it smell it because <laughs> who would have thought that smell having it next to my pillow and smelling it would have had an effect yeah, and they all affect a little differently. Like even like you said, putting something under your tongue, you're going to absorb it in a different way. It might feel differently. I try to write down like 
you know, how I did something just so I can kind of compare like, oh, it gave me this kind of dreams and, you know, tell people or whatever. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it requires discipline and focus mm -hmm. and, you know, testing yourself. But I, I do it now a little more consciously, uh, write things down and and um, so that I can have the conversations with people since people are interested. So let me ask you, when it comes to dreams versus meditation, have you found that uh, meditating helps you to be able to recall your dreams better or helps you to dream? It definitely does. Um, and I've started meditating more recently, like in the past six months or so, I've been trying to do like even five minutes a day. I'm kind of like you, I feel like I'm not good at it, but I think that's all just like not even a thing. Cause if you're trying, you're good at it. Like, you know, you're not, nobody's like, I don't know. I, I feel like even if I do one minute to five minutes, um, it helps a lot with lucid dreaming because lucid dreaming is kind of like being consciously present. It's kind of like mindfulness meditation. So it's a skill that really helps like a background skill. And it's even proven that people that are more frequent meditators, lucid dream more and stuff like that. So I know that it does help. So I focus more so on just mindfulness meditation, even if I'm not sitting and breathing for 10 minutes straight, I'll just try to be very mindful and aware of my surroundings and like really feel things around me, use my senses in that moment of mindfulness, which is like the basis of a reality check, right, is to be mindful right. and present. That translates into your dream because when you're there, you're like, okay, I'm here. I'm looking around. Oh, I'm in a dream, you know? it translates. Yeah. So it definitely helps. Um, like when I'm more into my practice, I have more lucid dreams. And I remember more dreams in general, like lucid mm -hmm. dreams aside. Um, if I meditate before bed, especially it helps me with incubation. I like to meditate on whatever it is that I want to solve. And then I'll usually dream about it when I do that. So 100%. Yeah, yeah. And I was just curious, because I haven't seen any research on it, uh, how meditation spills over into the dream life, but it only makes sense. Okay, so here's a question I would like to ask you. This is the question I ask people. Because when I do, the, the, you know, I read the research and the latest studies and blah, blah, blah. And this is what they say about dreams. And I'm like, mm, that doesn't apply to me. And then I'm like, am I just trying to be special or are they just coming up with stuff? <laughs> so, you know, they say that they being the people who study dreams and, you know, study the brain, that your first dream happens an hour and a half in. And then it's every 90 minutes or so. In, in that time but I dream immediately do you, do you dream immediately yeah sometimes so it used to be thought that we only dream in REM okay well now we know that you can dream in any phase of sleep and you know research is kind of like yeah it's scientifically proven but it's only based on that data set and what they found in that experiment so it's nothing applies to everybody but I do feel like my most vivid dreams when I wake up right out of REM sleep and I do test this for myself because I do a lot of wake back to bed, which is that lucid dreaming technique where you wake up right when you're in your REM sleep. So if you track your sleep, you can know when you're in REM. So in that longest REM phase, it gets longer as you go out every cycle. I'll remember the most vivid dreams and I'll usually be lucid. Um, but I do dream immediately because there's hypnagogic dreams, which is before I even fully fall asleep, I'm having dreams. And right. they're mixed in with whatever's around me. And that's a different type of dream than the dreams I have in the middle of the night. And my best dreams are in the morning, like an hour or two before I wake up when I'm still kind of lingering and I'm like kind of waking up. Those are my best dreams. If And if I wake up and go back to sleep at like 6, 7 a.m. when I still have like a few hours to sleep in, super lucid, super vivid. So I feel like different times of the night give me different like flavor dreams. Right, right. Yeah, and that's what I found for myself as well. And that first dream, that immediate dream is a rapid eye movement dream. Um, and so, you know, it happens and I'll, you know, of course I'm clocking it and I can wake up and go, okay, I've only been asleep for 20 minutes. I had three, two dreams since then. So the conversation that, you know, we don't dream until I'm like, that doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's been disproven because now we know that we can dream in any phase of sleep. But again, science is funny because it's like scientists are just a bunch of people like me and you trying to figure something out and they don't know so they're trying to figure it out and they either have the money and resources to do or they don't and dreaming is so hard to research because we're so different and dreams are so personal and in our heads that it's really hard to like research it accurately and the set that they're using the people that they're using are you know tend to be a pretty the same seems to be the same group you know they're not getting going out and getting the 80 year old grandmother who you know who's latina that makes a difference as well. 
hundred percent. There's a big lack in just research data pool representation of just society as a whole. Um, right. It's hard, but I'm I'm grateful for any sort of dream research. The fact that we're even here when there used to be nothing and dreams are like crazy and weird. <laughs> At least now there's some science behind it and interest in the academic world, but it's still exactly. not respected in like the academic field. And I don't think it, but I think in the next 10 years, it will be like growing. Oh my God. I know that it will be. And that's what I'm really, I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm waiting for that to happen. It's, it's going to happen. As a matter of fact, I even did a TikTok on this, a, a video on this, telling people to, you know, don't dismiss your children's dreams. You want them to stay in tune with that because, you know, 10 years from now, they're going to be, there's going to be so much data about dreams that they will be able to profit and benefit from it. Whereas, you know, your generation all the way back, you know, you were told, ah, oh, it's just a dream. Oh, I'll go back to sleep. Don't worry about it. And we, it was dismissed. And so now we're trying to, you know, play catch up. No, it means something. And we're trying to learn it now. But by the time, you know, this next generation, 10 years from now, they will have access to the data. And it's people like us who are, you know, reminding people and waking people up that's going to help fuel that even more so. Yes, this gave me goosebumps because it's one of my favorite topics, which is the next generation of dreamers. I've done like three podcast episodes about this already, and I love talking about it because like, how do you raise your kids to pay attention to their dreams and to be conscious dreamers and all the things that maybe we lacked? Because I grew up Catholic and, you know, my mom was great. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, we, she never really focused on my dreams and she didn't really even know what a lucid dream was. And so, yeah, I kind of had to figure it out for myself. So I love asking people, how do you like teach your kids about dreams? Yeah, well, I, and I taught my kids. So I have five. My oldest is 29, which is really amazing because I'm 25. So I don't even know how that happened, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, my oldest is 29 my youngest is 16 and I have all of their lives because I've all my life been fascinated by dreams you know I would wake up and ask them you know what did you dream about last night so did you dream anything and now I really want to do some research on children's dreams but you know that takes a lot of time and money and, and all of that but I would love to do that because what I found with my children who were in a, they were in a very safe environment, solid, you know, home, mother and father, all of that, homeschooled and, and everything, they homeschooled them for 22 years. They still had very scary dreams. They were, you know, like you said, your five-year-old dream, an uh, animal is chasing them, an elephant. And so I would listen to their dreams like, wow, how can you have such fearful dreams and you have such a pleasant home? Can I do something wrong? <laughs> Oh, but they're so vivid, their imagination. Right, right. And just understanding that, you know, they're coming into the world. So they do have fears mm -hmm. that they're not conscious of while they're playing, but it's in the background and that's what's showing up in their dreams. Um, but yeah, I would just ask them every morning about their dreams. Um, when they hit puberty, I would tell them, you know, talk about incubating a dream. You know, think about when you go to sleep tonight, I want you to ask yourself, where are you going to live in 10 years? Uh, how many children are you going to have? Ask yourself that. And, you know, just to start preparing them to incubate and get answers from their dreams. Um, there was a time where I would wake them up with the children up from sleep. <clears throat> I'll go in with pen and paper. Morning, little children. Hey, how old are you now? And they'll say, well, I don't know, nine. Why were you asking? me? Okay. When you're 29 years old, where do you live? And I'll just kind of write down they're half asleep, they're half awake, and I'll just make them give me some answers. <laughs> and I have that information when I scribbled out, I have it somewhere, you know. You gotta see if some of it is accurate. Exactly, exactly. And that was the point, you know, it's like, because I do believe, I do know, I know that we are given glimpses of our future. And if we can tune into that, that can kind of direct us. My 29 year old, he woke up one day and I was asking him, you know, we're sitting at the kitchen table and I was asking about the dreams. He's like, I had a dream that I was playing a piano and I was a big boy and I had on a suit and it was, and the way he described the suit, it was a tuxedo. So he's taking piano lessons and he had a dream that he was a big boy playing a piano in a tuxedo and there were all people sitting there for watching him. Okay, but that's a pretty, you know, that only makes sense. And so I said, how old were you as a big boy? Because I'm trying to determine, you know, where is he going with this? Because he hated piano lessons. And the way he described himself, my brain said, okay, so he's about 18, 19 years old. Because, you know, when you're eight, a big boy is a 19-year-old. Yeah. And 
And sure enough, you know, he became classically trained pianist. Uh, matter of fact, this weekend, I was just in Charleston for one of his concerts. He is phenomenal. Uh, he's really good. And he had a dream about that when he was younger. He had a dream. He was in a tuxedo playing a piano. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that you were able to follow along the whole way. I aspire to be that kind of mother. I will be waking my children up in the middle. And I don't even have kids, but one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask them because they know. You know, I didn't know because I had I grew up on the south side of Chicago and there were too many survival issues there. So I wasn't tuning into my future. Um, but the things that I was interested in then as a child, I'm still interested in today. Um, I wanted to go to school to be a psychologist, even though I didn't really, really know what a psychologist was. I just knew I liked the whole idea of people and minds and all of that. But I didn't do it because the company that I worked for said they were only going to pay for business classes. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just major in business then. So I didn't do it. Well, here I am on this side of life going, I'm going to school and major in psychology, dang on it. God dog it, that's 30 years that I could have been practicing. And so I've made the, you know, the complete turnaround. But even then I was interested in it. And and even as a child and should have, you know, just stuck with it. Well, you did stick with it because here you are full circle. And all along the way, you know, I've studied and read and, you know, I've, I'm literally a therapist for all my family and friends <laughs> and people who don't know me. I'm a therapist. Anyway, without the degrees yeah dude, you should totally do it and you know what I so I'm 28 I have a I got my degree in psychology and I feel like everything I've learned I learned a lot I loved it it was great and I, but so much of what I learned was not thanks to my degree like it's through talking to people and learning things on my own and exploring my consciousness and there are things that a psychology teacher in a university are never gonna you know go over with you um but I've had some cool teachers and you know it's amazing. I love psychology. So that's yeah. why part of what I do on my podcast is bridge the science and the spirituality and find that middle ground because that's where all the good stuff is. Yes. Yeah. And you're right. What you even if you have that degree, you really don't learn until you're experiencing the things in life. Yeah. As you experience the things in life, then the degree makes sense. But so often people, you know, they're they walk away from the degree information at that point. They go a whole different route because I got to make money and, you know. You do learn when you're actually living it as opposed to just just a degree. Exactly. But, you know, the degree is helpful. It makes I've noticed it makes people be like, OK, maybe she knows what she's talking about. Right. And yeah. But not because <laughs> these people told me because I've been figuring this stuff out for 20 years. But whatever. <laughs> exactly. Not because I got the piece of paper. As like a TikTok creator or just online content creation, like, have you found anything that people are like really hesitant towards or like what any criticism that you get or something that you notice a lot online that you feel like people might could benefit from hearing? Um, I am amazed at the superstition around dreams in this day and age. This information age with all this freaking information why are y'all still saying things like, ooh, don't talk to your dream characters because- Thank you. I did a TikTok um, that, where I you know, gave this activity. You know, when you go to bed tonight, say, I'm going to sleep, I'm going to get, um, what was it? I'm going to get a gift. And then when you wake up, you know, so write it out. And then when you wake up, you look at the other side of the paper. Ooh, I'm back from dreamland. I got a gift. And the point of that is to, set the intention. You know, the point of that is to set the intention. The point of that is to speak to your subconscious mind and then recognize the connection. And the gift that you will get when you wake up could be, you know, a song in the morning. You can get a memory about a, a, a childhood memory. You could wake up and, you know, that particular day, you're not dealing with depression. You can wake up and a, a lot of things can happen, but just set that intention. Oh my gosh, the number of people they're like, don't do that. You're talking to demons. Don't do that. Oh, she's telling you how yeah. to, how, oh, she's a witch telling you how to, you're talking to yourself. You're going to bed. What? So yeah, that blows me away. So it really makes me angry, but I have to, you know, tone it down and try to help move people along. Um, I understand the reason behind it. And that is that, um, you know, when we are asleep, we are in another dimension. And people recognize that, but they don't know how to deal with that because the past generations were, they were afraid of that other dimension, 
And so they perpetuated the fears and here we are still in this day and age, this generation is calling out superstitions and old wives tales about dreams. But we are in a different dimension when we are asleep. You know, science can't explain it. Um, there is a connection in that dimension and this dimension. Uh, but now things like if you eat in your sleep, you're gonna, somebody could be giving you some food that's gonna poison you when you wake up and you're gonna be sick when you wake up. That to me, that's just craziness because guess what? You can eat in your waking life and be poisoned. <laughs> right. And if you believe it too, that's going to play a role in your dream experience. So if you go to bed thinking that demons are going to taunt you, you're not going to have a fun time in your dreams. It's the power of the mind to protect you. And I try to tell people that all the time. This is like my daily TikTok battle. So I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, mine as well. Oh my gosh, people. It's the 21st century. Stop yeah, and it. stop spreading fear to other people, especially like you said, there's people, me and you, we get it. But then there's the new people who are starting to get into dreams and they're like, oh, I'm scared because I heard this and that. I'm like, don't let yourself get ideas in your head because your own experience is going to be your best teacher. And who knows, like your dreams are thought responsive. So if you're scared and you're thinking something bad's going to happen, that's going to play a role in your dream content. You're going to have that experience. Yeah. And it's kind of like life. Ooh, if I'm Ooh. afraid, in this waking world, they're out to get me and the government's going to get me and the people are going to get me and it's all come. Then that's what I'm going to live. Yes, 100 percent. And like you said, and I am a believer of we go into a different dimension and we can interact with different beings and entities. I do believe in all that stuff, but I believe that there's ways to protect yourself for one, that you can choose which side you're on and who you attract and just because, you know, you do your protection and you have a strong mind or whatever, we still have nightmares every once in a while. You know, it's unavoidable here and there. Um, I wouldn't say, like, don't get into dream work just because you're scared of sleep paralysis or something like that. Right, right. exactly, exactly. It's going to happen. Yeah, okay, so tell me, what do you offer as protection? What do you tell people to do to protect themselves? I focus a lot on telling people the power of the mind. So tell yourself if you're having trouble calming your anxiety, like have a little relaxing evening routine, like try to go to sleep and wake up in a peaceful way, whatever you have to do to make that happen for yourself, um, slowly and gently and have like a little prayer or affirmation that you say to yourself, whatever it is that works for you. I use things like, you know, um, essential oils and, um, scents that help me feel relaxed and safe crystals things like that that are like known for protection or whatever but even if you're not into that kind of stuff whatever helps you feel safe whether it's like prayer meditation do that consistently and have a routine around it especially if you're into dream work take time to intentionally only call in positive love and energy into your space or energy that wants to help you because you can kind of decide who you let into your space it, it's pretty simple honestly yeah. And all those things apply to this dimension. Everything that you just said, right? We walk around saying affirmations to ourselves, being intentional, decide who you're going to interact with, you know, put up your prayers, put action right here. Yeah. I just did a whole TikTok on that because, oh my gosh, I did a, a, um, a stitch because the guy was saying four things not to do in your dreams. Dude, all four things you just named that happen in your dream will happen in the waking life. Um, when you are lucid dreaming or astral projecting, do you astral project? More so lucid dreaming, but I do feel like there's an overlap. And so have you encountered entities that were trying to harm you or were you dealing with your own subconscious um, fears? I feel like I have, you know, I have. I've have had dreams that I can just feel off a dream character, off their energies. I've had dreams where I feel like I was vulnerable. That's what I was going to say is that people tend to think you're vulnerable in your sleep, which to an extent you are because we're not as native. Our waking self at least isn't as native to that world as our inner self might be. But I, I have had dreams where I felt like, okay, this is not something good that I want to interact with. If I'm lucid, then I will literally just disengage and do something else. Um, mm -hmm. But if I'm not lucid, I take time and I'm easy with myself when I wake up. What's, what I have found, though, is sometimes when I have dreams like that, I feel like there's an overlaying protection over me. And that's part of because of my practice of what I bring into my life, keeping my energy positive and divine or whatever. I feel like when I have those types of dreams, I have like something comes over the dream and like wipes it clean and I'm good, you know, kind of takes out whatever's not good for me around there. 
Um, so I've trained that to happen subconsciously. And I notice it happen a lot where when I'm like in a shady dream. But for the most part, it doesn't happen that often. So I feel like that combined with my conscious dream protection, I feel like I'm I'm good. Yeah, yeah. And and that's what I tell people. Okay, so again, I don't lucid dream. I've astro projected spontaneously as well. I think that we do it anyway, even if you're not aware of it. So we're astro projecting all night. Uh, but I haven't had the experience of an entity is with me and you know, and I feel I feel that. But I have talked to people who tell me and I believe them that it's very real, that there is a real world in there where there are spirits. But I also remind people in this third dimension, you are protected. You have angels. We come here with protection, with guidance. We come here with ancestors who are, you know, holding us up. We come here with angels. So if spirit will do that in this world, why not do the same thing in that dimension as well? You are also protected and you just got to claim that just like here. You know, if I'm walking down the street and I'm fearful because, oh my gosh, they're going to get me at any moment. I have to pause because if I'm doing this, they're going to get me at any moment who can read my fearful energy and they will attack me. Um, but if I pause and carry myself in such a way, okay, remind myself of my affirmations. Okay, the angels are with me. I am safe. I'm protected. Let me hurry up and get home. <laughs> then I am safe. The same thing in the dream world. You could do the same thing. You're safe and protected. Why would spirit not protect you when you're vulnerable, when you're uh, unconscious when you're in a com com comatose state and you are now in another dimension why would spirit not give you some form of protection 100 percent. yeah i totally agree and i've noticed it seen it happen for myself and i always tell people like you always wake up no one's ever died from a dream that i know of like even if you have a scary time you'll wake up and you know maybe you take some space clear your, your head of it but you know you'll be okay when you say you've astral projected, what is that like for you? And how is that different from a dream? I know there's a lot of controversy and confusion about the definitions. And I try not to label things too much. But for you, what, how do you differentiate? Okay. So, it, it ha again, like I, like I said, for me, it, I believe that. And I have to go by my belief and other people I talk to. Because for me, it happens. It's a spontaneous thing. It's random. I got to go, was that? That was astral projection? Oh, I guess so. Maybe... Um, but there are people who tell me, you know, they literally went to another place, they could see it, and then they can go there the next day and confirm that that place does exist. Um, the one dream that I had that made me go, okay, astral projection evidently is real. Um, I dreamt that I was walking through a factory. I could hear clearly the machines whirling. I could see the office off to the side, off to my right, and there's a glass office with the managers and the supervisors in there. I can hear the radio being played. Uh, somebody's playing some music in this factory. I am kind of floating through the air and I'm going to this girl who's in the back and she's working on whatever she's working on. And the closer I get to her, the more I can hear her and her, th and her thoughts. And then I get to her and now I am her and I'm looking at what she was looking at and she's trying to figure out how to do this and she's saying to herself they didn't teach me this in training I can't remember how do you do this and she's like you know kind of freaking out about the job she's like I cannot lose this job I cannot lose this job and I know she has three children at home it's nighttime she's working third shift and then she goes oh, okay, I get it. Oh, okay, that's it. That's how you do it. And okay, all right. Okay, good. Phew. Okay, thank you. And then when she says thank you, then I now walk out the back of her and I leave and I go out the back of the door out of that back of the factory and the dream goes into another dream. That dream made me wake up and say, wow. Hmm. So when I've had people talk about, you know, being warriors, they go into the dream world and they fight for, you know, they fight entities for the world and all of that. There are people who help other people. Oh, okay, that's what I'm doing when I go to sleep. Because I walked to her, helped her to understand this job, what she was supposed to be doing, and then I left when she got it. And it wasn't a, like I've, people talk about having dreams of, you know, past lives, and they are that person in a dream. I haven't had that experience. So it's really weird for me uh, to be this 
dream interpreter with this limited amount of this limited quality of dreams when everybody else is off seeing aliens and they're often, you know, in other galaxies and living past lives. And I'm like, oh, I helped a girl at a job and I, I was walking up the street and helping a kid. And I, you know, but as I listen to other people tell their stories, you know, it definitely says that there is something more to, in this dream world, this dream land, there's something more than just your subconscious mind. Um, the mind is, the mind is everything. The mind is all, you know, everything is in there. And so uh, they'll never be able to do the research and fully acknowledge and give credit to all that happens in the dream world, in the mind. I was going to say, it's kind of like with, um, OBEs, you know, out of body experiences or even uh, near death experiences, right? A near death experience happens 100% in the mind. The person is right there in the hospital being worked on. But when they come back, they can tell the doctors, I saw you do this and you said that still right there. So when it comes to the research, all that uh, neuroscientists and people who study dreams, all they can do is take the stories that people tell just like with the near-death experiences, just like the out-of-body experiences. All they can do is take the stories that people tell and just, you know, categorize them. They'll never be able to prove it, unfortunately. Yeah, it's hard to work with anecdotes. And I think, I do think science will evolve to be more open-minded, but I mean, anecdotes are still really cool. I am always fascinated by near-death experiences and OBEs and everything. Like, that's why I started a podcast. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and, and I guess a near death experience, you can get the proof when the person can tell you what went on in the room. Yeah. Like how right. would they have known that? Right. Exactly. The same thing with the body experience. They can tell you what happened in that house on the other side of the country or other, they can do that. They can tell you what happened in someone else's life mm -hmm. and they can say, I used to be that person. So there are ways that you can kind of prove it, but you got to get enough of those stories to yeah you know, to follow up on. But with dreams, you know, it's my experience in my hand when I was on that planet on another galaxy, right? And who can say that I really, that I was, I wasn't there. You know, it came, is there a way to test to see if I was really there and I was that young woman at the job, who, the woman who had three children? There's no way to test that, yeah. right? I'll let give a name. If I got her name and, you know, was able to get her story, then okay, we can do the research. But you know, you can't always do that. It does happen. But, you know, now that I think about it, it, in a way, there's benefits to the fact that some things aren't specifically scientifically understood. Because with things like dreams, you don't want a rigid boundary of how to define things. That would kind of maybe not steer us in the right direction. Exactly. And so that's the reason why we have to trust. Yes. We have to trust. We have to trust ourselves. We have to know. And, and the only way we can really trust ourselves if we've experimented enough with our own dreams to be able to articulate our own experiences and, and understand ourselves. Where can people find you? What do you have to share? Heavenandearthconnect.com. That's my website where people can come, they can book sessions for dream interpretations. Um, I am online and in Instagram, heavenandearthconnect.com. Uh, TikTok, it's me, Lady T. Uh, they're on TikTok. I have a YouTube channel that I'm supposed to be working on. I have a few videos up there. I just need to do more and I haven't. I am planning a dream incubation retreat in the next couple of months in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's coming up where I teach people how to incubate a dream. I'm so looking forward to doing that on a regular, consistent basis. Uh, I want to do that like every single month um, just to teach people how to get the answers from their dreams, how to pull, summon forth a dream. Um, that will help them to move forward in life. Uh, final thoughts. Dang, I listen to your podcast all the time. You always ask that question. I was like, I got to come up with a final thought. <laughs> I, I usually like when it just comes out in the moment. Final thought, pay attention to your dreams. They are powerful and you got to learn your own language, the language of your subconscious in order to be able to, to live it.